In this lesson, we're gonna look at one-to-one -one functions, derivatives of inverse trig functions, and also a derivative of an inverse function. This first definition says a function f is called a one-to-one -one function if it never takes on the same value twice. So you can see you have f of one x value is not equal to f of another x value whenever those x values are different, so you don't want the same height. So I drew a generic graph for f, drew a horizontal line through the curve, and you can see that at two different x values, the graph attains the same height. And I wrote it out, f is not one to one because you have f of x sub one equals f of x sub two. So we can use the horizontal line test to check whether a function is one to one or not. It says a function is one to one if and only if no horizontal line intersects its graph more than once. So this next example says determine whether the function is one to one. So for the first graph, we have y equals x squared. I'm just gonna draw a really quick sketch. And if you draw a horizontal line, it hits the graph more than once at two different x values. Therefore, when answering the question, is it one to one, we would say no. Again, it's not one to one because you have two different x values at which the graph attains the same height. For part b, we have the square root of x minus one. If you were to draw a horizontal line through the graph at any point, it will only hit the graph once. Therefore, when answering the question, is this graph one to one, we would say yes. For our next definition, it says let f be a one-to-one -one function with domain a and range b. Then its inverse function, and we write that as f to the negative one or f inverse, has domain b and range a. It's defined by, so you have f inverse of y equals x, or you can rewrite it as f of x equals y for any y in b. So a couple things to point out, for a function f, its domain is a and range is b, but for an inverse function, its domain is b and range is a. So functions that are inverses of each other, their domain and range flip. Also, when you have inverses of each other, you have these cancellation equations. So f inverse of f of x is equal to f of f inverse of x. It's a composition. When you take the composition of two functions that are inverses of each other, you get just x. We also have a note here. It says the graph of f inverse is obtained by reflecting the graph of f about the line y equals x. And I wrote out a comment here and wrote, the graphs of f and f inverse are symmetric about the line y equals x. This next theorem says, if f is a one-to-one -one continuous function defined on an interval, then its inverse function, f inverse, is also continuous. And last we have, if f is a one-to-one -one differentiable function, it can be proved that its inverse function is also differentiable, except, of course, where the tangent line might be vertical. Next, we're gonna look at inverse trig functions. So first, we wanna look at sine inverse of x, or remember, it's also referred to as arc sine. So sine inverse is the same as arc sine. So our first bullet point says f of x equals sine inverse, it has a domain from negative one to one. What you wanna remember is for the graph of sine, the range goes from negative one to one. So sine inverse, the domain will go from negative one to one. Because again, functions and their inverses, their domain and ranges switch. And then we have noted that the range for sine inverse is gonna go from negative pi over two to positive pi over two, because over that range, that's where the function passes the horizontal line test. Then we know that the sine function is continuous, so the inverse sine function will also be continuous. Then we have, we know that from section 3.5 that the sine function is differentiable, so its inverse sine function is also gonna be differentiable. And then right here we have, since y equals sine inverse of x means you can rewrite this statement as sine of y equals x, meaning sine of what angle equals x, and we have that y is gonna be in between negative pi over two to positive pi over two, we can find the derivative of sine inverse by differentiating this equation implicitly with respect to x. So we take sine of y equals x and we take the derivative implicitly with respect to x. So the derivative of sine of y is cosine of y. Because this is a non-x term, we times by y prime. The derivative of x is one, and then we isolate the y prime. So y prime is now gonna be equal to one over cosine of y. We're gonna use this Pythagorean trig identity that sine squared plus cosine squared equals one, and we're gonna isolate cosine. So we subtract the sine squared term over, then we take the square root of both sides, and we get plus or minus the square root of one minus sine squared of y. Remember, sine of y is x, so we're gonna substitute x in for sine of y, getting one minus x squared. And then finally, there's a note down here. We're gonna use the positive option. And again, that's because if you look at the graph of cosine, and you look at its graph from negative pi over two to positive pi over two, you'll see that the graph is above the x-axis 
in between those values. So we have cosine is equal to the square root of 1 minus x squared, so that's what gets substituted in. And now we have our derivative. The derivative of sine inverse is 1 over the square root of 1 minus x squared. We kind of do a similar process for tangent. We know that tangent's differentiable, therefore tan inverse is also differentiable. To find its derivative, we let y equal tan inverse. Then we know we can rewrite this statement as tan of y equals x. And we take the derivative of this equation implicitly with respect to x. The derivative of tangent is secant squared. Then we times by y prime. Derivative of x is 1. We isolate the y prime and get 1 over secant squared of y. And we have another Pythagorean identity. Secant squared equals 1 plus tangent squared. So we're going to plug 1 plus tangent squared in for secant squared. And again, because tangent of y equals x, we're going to substitute x right here and we get 1 over 1 plus x squared. So this is the derivative of tan inverse of x. Here we have the derivative of all six inverse trig functions. The derivative of sine inverse, again, is 1 over the square root of 1 minus x squared. The derivative of cosine inverse, thank goodness, is just this guy, but with a negative in front. And again, the derivative of tan inverse is 1 over, and it's written here as x squared plus 1, which is the same as 1 plus x squared. And it's great because the derivative of cotangent inverse is just the same thing, but has a negative in front. And again, these also correspond. So the derivative of secant inverse is 1 over x square root of x squared minus 1, and the derivative of cosecant inverse is going to be negative that same expression. This example says to differentiate. We have f of x equals secant inverse of 3x. So I wrote the derivative of secant inverse of x over here for reference. It's 1 over x, the square root of x squared minus 1. So we're taking the derivative of secant inverse of 3x. So according to this formula, wherever we have an x, we're going to plug in 3x. So we have 3x, we plug it here, and then we have 3x squared minus 1 all underneath the radical. And then finally, because this isn't just x, because it's 3x, we're going to chain rule. So the derivative of 3x is 3, so we're going to times that to the end. At this point, we're going to simplify. So these 3s are going to cancel. And here's our final answer. We have 1 over x square root of 9x squared minus 1. For this example, we have g of x equals x times arc tangent of the square root of 4x plus 1. Because we have two x's, we're going to use the product rule. Before we get started on the product rule, first I made a note that instead of square root of 4x plus 1, I rewrote it as quantity to the 1 half. And then I also have the derivative of tan inverse for our reference. It's 1 over x squared plus 1. Again, you could also write it as 1 over 1 plus x squared. Either way is fine. The derivative of x is 1. And the derivative of arc tan, remember arc tan is the same as tan inverse. So whatever we have in here, it's going to be 1 over that squared plus 1. Okay, so I got this plugged into our formula 1 over x squared plus 1. Because this isn't just x, we're going to chain rule. So we're going to times by the derivative of the inside function, and the derivative is going to be 1 half, leave its inside the same, then subtract 1 from the exponent, and then times by the derivative of its inside function, which is going to be 4. And before we write it all the way out as a big product rule, I first want to simplify this 4 and 2. When we multiply these out, we have x, and then we have times all of this. The square root square, they cancel, so we have 4x plus 1 plus 1, so that's going to be 4x plus 2. And then we still have this 2 over here when those 4 and 2 canceled. And then finally, this expression has a negative exponent, so we're going to move it to the denominator. So let's see if I can get all of this in 1. And I'm noticing we can factor a 2 out here. So then these 2s are going to cancel, and that should be our final answer. Okay, so let's double check all of this. We have x in the numerator. We have the quantity 2x plus 1 times the square root of 4x plus 1. Then we have plus arctan of the square root of 4x plus 1. This example says y equals x cosine inverse of x minus the square root of 1 minus x squared. And I have the derivative of cosine inverse of x written here for reference. And I also rewrote the square root of 1 minus x squared as quantity to the 1 half. All right, so to take the derivative over here, we're going to use the product rule. So we're going to multiply these, and then we add the product of these. And now we're going to take the derivative of this term. And then when we apply the chain rule, we want to times by the derivative of the inside function, which is going to be timesing by negative 2x. At this point, these 2s are going to cancel. This negative and negative is going to multiply to become a positive. And I'm going to bring this expression to the denominator and then turn it back into a square root. And our very last step, these are exact opposites, so they're going to cancel each other out. 
So our final answer is cosine inverse of x. Next, we're going to look at the derivative of an inverse function. Our definition says if f is a one-to-one -one differentiable function, its inverse function, f inverse, is also differentiable. And in order to take the derivative of an inverse function, you're going to use this formula, 1 divided by f prime of f inverse of x. And it says provided the denominator does not equal to 0. So I have the proof here for reference. If f and g are inverses of each other, then we know by cancellation equations that f of g of x is going to equal to x. So we're going to take the derivative with respect to x. So according to the chain rule, the derivative of f of g of x is going to be f prime, leave the g the same, then times by g prime. The derivative of x is 1. And then we're going to isolate g prime because g is the inverse of x. So g prime is going to be equal to 1 over f prime of g of x. And this matches this formula because f and g are inverses. So this says f prime, f prime, and then it's of f inverse of x or of g. Our next example says f is x cubed plus 2x minus 1. Find the slope of the tangent line to the graph of f inverse at the point 2, 1. So since we need the slope of the tangent line to the graph of f inverse, to find slope, that means we're taking the derivative of f inverse, and we're doing this at the point 2, 1. So we're going to use the x value 2, and we're going to use our formula from above. So to take the derivative of an inverse function, it's 1 over f prime of f inverse of x. So I plugged it in, 1 over f prime of f inverse of 2. And here's a reminder, when we have f inverse has the point 2 comma 1, that means for the graph of f, it would correspond to the point 1 comma 2. Because again, f and its inverse, you have a point and the x and y coordinates get switched. And I just want to point out that 1 comma 2 does work on this function. If you plug in 1 for x here and here, you'll get 1 plus 2 is 3 minus 1 makes 2. So this point does satisfy the function. Okay, back to the problem. We have f inverse of 2. So f inverse of 2 is going to be the value 1. And to finish this problem, we just need to take the derivative of f. So now when we plug in 1, we get 5. So the slope of the tangent line to the graph of f inverse at the point 2 comma 1 is 1 fifth. For this example, it says if f of x equals 3 plus x squared plus tangent of pi x over 2, and x is between negative 1 and 1, and g is a function such that f of g of x equals x for all x, what is the value of g prime of 3? So again, because we're given the fact that f of g of x equals x, that means that f and g are inverses of each other. Here's our function f, g is its inverse, and we need to find the derivative of its inverse. So the derivative of an inverse is going to be 1 over f prime of, and this is f inverse of 3. But again, g is f inverse. So I just wrote g instead of f inverse, but you could totally write f inverse of 3 if you wanted to. The key to this problem is g of 3 means that 3 is the x-coordinate of the point for g. And again, because g and f are inverses of each other, you can switch their x and y's. So if this is for g 3, a y value, then for f it's going to be some x value, comma 3. So again, x's and y's switch on inverse functions. For f, since 3 is a y value, we're putting it right here in place of y. So we're writing 3 equals, and then we're just copying the rest of the equation over. So the rest of the equation is just 3 plus x squared plus tangent of pi x over 2. And then we get to this equation, and this is probably the only time in calculus I'll ever say this, but we're going to guess and check. You're going to guess an x value, plug it in and see if it works. If it does, then that's going to be what you fill in here and then fill in here. The nice thing about these problems is they're crazy rigged. So when you guess values to plug in, you're always guessing like 0, 1, or 2, or maybe negative 1, negative 2, um, and usually one of those values works. So if you had to guess, since this equals 0, so since this equals 0, we're going to try the number 0. If we plug in 0 here and here, remember tangent of 0 is 0, so it works. So when the y value is 3, the corresponding x value on f is going to be 0. And then we go back to its inverse, and those values switch. So instead of the 3 being the y value, now 3 is the x value, and 0 is going to be the y value. So now we need g of 3. g of 3 is 0. And then last step, we need to find f prime of 0. So the derivative of f, we're going to start with 3. The derivative of 3 is 0. The derivative of x squared is 2x. The derivative of tangent is secant squared. Leave the inside the same, and then we times by the derivative of the inside. And the derivative of pi x over 2 is just going to be pi over 2. 
And finally, we're plugging in zero. So secant is one over cosine. So I just wrote this as cosine of zero quantity squared. Cosine of zero is one. One squared is one. So you just get pi over two. And the very last step, we're gonna do copy dot flip. So we're gonna go one times two over pi. So here's our final answer, two over pi. This example says, suppose f of x equals x squared plus x plus four. If g is equal to f prime of x, what is the value of g prime of six? So I set this one up just like the last problem, g prime of six using the formula for the derivative of an inverse function is gonna be one over f prime of, g is the inverse of, and then you plug in six. So we need g of six. So for g, six is the x value. We need the corresponding y value. And again, we have inverses, so their x's and y's switch. So right here it says f of, and it's something comma six. Six is the y value, so to solve for x, we're gonna plug six in right here. So we have this equation, and we're just gonna do it real quick by guessing a number. If you use zero, you would only get four equals six, so obviously that doesn't work. If we use one, one squared is one, one plus one is two, two plus four makes six, so that works. So for f, we'd have one comma six, that means for g, we would have six comma one. So when x is six, that means y is one, so g of six equals one, and now we just need to take the derivative of f. So f prime is 2x plus 1, and we get f prime of 1 is 3. So our final answer is 1 third. This example says the function f of x equals 3x plus e to the x is 1 to 1 and differentiable. Find the derivative of f inverse of 1. So I plug this into the formula. It's 1 over f prime of f inverse of 1. So that means for f inverse, x is 1 and we need the corresponding y value because these are inverses we go x comma 1 1 is the y value so we go 1 equals 3x plus e to the x and again looking at this equation if we try 0 i believe it works 3 times 0 is 0 e to the 0 is 1 so 1 equals 1. so f inverse of 1 is going to be 0. and finally we take the derivative of f and we get 3 plus e to the x so we get four, and our final answer is gonna be one fourth. This example says, suppose f is a one to one function and defined by the following table of values. So we have x, f of x, and f prime of x, and then we have our values going across, and we want to find the derivative of f inverse of nine. So again, we're still using the same formula. So to set it up, we go one over f prime of f inverse of nine, and I wrote the same notation over here to help with the problem. So f inverse of nine means for f inverse, we have nine comma and then some y value. Because these are inverses for f, we're gonna say some x value comma nine. So we're gonna look at the chart and let's go along the row for f. We have a y value of nine and when that occurs for f, that means the corresponding x value is four. So now we have that f inverse of nine equals four. And finally, it says f prime of four, so we go to the graph, f prime of four is one. So our final answer is one.